question number two tonight. Rabbi Kellerman said that previously, no one is intrinsically an addict or intrinsically has an anger problem, etc., but everyone can change. I was brought up with this concept, but I find myself hitting a brick wall when it comes to labels. When someone has been diagnosed with high-functioning autism, OCD, or ADHD, many medical people and others that I've encountered see these people as stuck in their diagnosis. Yes, they can move somewhat up and down the scale, but they are who they are. I see these labels as signposts. If I've been diagnosed with autism, I have extra avoda, I have extra work to do in the area of empathy, just as the next person has extra avoda in the area of anger or jealousy. If I'm diagnosed with OCD, I need to work on my bitacho and my trust in God to a greater degree than the next person, and so on. My question is, is my thinking flawed? Most people and professionals I meet seem to see the world very differently. Okay, so this is really, really, really important. Sometimes, you know, I, I have a copy of the DSM-5 sitting on my shelf. And sometimes I'm very frustrated when I look at the categories because as most psychologists and psychiatrists and other therapists will tell you, almost nobody fits neatly into one category. Um, and the categories themselves, in order to, to, to include anybody, have to be so broad as to include lots of different people with lots of different profiles. The, in other words, what I'm saying is the DSM-5 is not um, a, a spiritual biology book. It doesn't, it's not precise in any way. It's, it's the opposite. It's imprecise. By the way, it's not a problem. The DSM-5 wasn't created as a spiritual biology lesson or a psychological uh, anatomy lesson. The, the DSM-5 was created to, to create insurance categories so that insurance companies would cover the cost of treating people uh, who have different types of disorders. And so they try to create these, these labels that will justify insurance payments. But they're not, the, these diagnostic categories are not meant to facilitate treatment. Treatment requires getting to know the very precise profile of the individual sitting in front of you. That's a side complaint about labels. But your complaint is, is also really important, and, and I hear it loud and clear, if I slap a label on somebody, perhaps I lock them in to that profile, and I assume that they're not going to ever climb out of it. So there are a couple of tour concepts that are underlying your question. Let me just share these tour concepts, and then we can go back and really analyze your question and get some clarity. The first tour concept is the distinction. I think I may have mentioned this in a past session at some point. The distinction between midos and tunos. Okay, both terms, midos and tunos, translate vaguely as traits. But obviously, they're different Hebrew words, so they mean different things. Midos are different than trunos in two ways. First, midos are either moral or immoral. Uh, for example, kindness is a mida, so is cruelty. Altruism is a mida, so is selfishness. Okay. In contrast, trunos aren't moral or immoral. They're not good or bad. They just are. The, the Talmud gives a, a classic example of this, saying that Love of blood is a tuna. Someone who loves blood could be a butcher. They could be a moil, someone who, who, who does circumcisions. They could be a murderer. Loving blood isn't inherently good or bad. It depends on how someone who loves blood channels his love of blood. What career does he pursue with that passion? A butcher does a great service for the community. He provides them with meat. A moil doesn't just do kindness for the community. He goes even further. It actually helps people fulfill the, the Torah commandment of, of performing a circumcision. So those are amazing ways to channel love of blood. Okay, but someone could choose to channel the tune of loving blood, not for the sake of the community service or not for the sake of, of mitzvahs. They could channel it for selfishness and cruelty. Then the person could become a murderer. So the first way that midos differ from trunos is that midos are either moral or immoral, and trunos are amoral. They're not good or bad. Okay, that's a very important difference. Now, there's a second very important difference between Midos and Tunos. And that is that Midos can change. A person's Midos are not locked. A cruel person can become kind. A selfish person can develop altruism. Okay, in contrast, Tunos can't change. They're so intrinsically woven into the human personality 
that if you try to rip them out, you tear out some of the person's essence at the same time. You'll destroy the person if you try to rip out their trunos. So if you can't change a truna, what can you do? So that I just mentioned. We can channel our inborn permanent traits to be used in the best possible way. That's how we manage trunos. We channel them. We don't change them. Okay, now, how do I know if I should channel or if I should change? How do I know if a particular trait is a mida, which should be changed, right? Or if it's a tuna and it's permanent and it's got to be channeled? And the answer is, if the trait is moral or immoral, it's a mida. And what's so amazing is, once you discover it's a mida, then you know it can be changed. The person is not locked into this. There is a way. I have to discover the way to change the mida. But there is a way to, to, to get out of this. However, if the trait is amoral, it's not good or bad, then it's a tuna, and it's not going to change. It's got to be channeled. If you try to rip it out of the person, you're going to do damage to the person. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you an example of this. Revolba once spoke about hyperactivity. What I'm about to say is probably not politically correct, but it's true. Um, Revolba asked, he said the word hyperactive means too active, and he asked, who drew the line? Who said that this level of activity, of, of activity is acceptable, but beyond this level of activity, that is pathological. By the way, I don't think Revolba knew uh, that, in truth, there are dozens of different standards for what constitutes hyperactive. In one state, hyperactivity is defined by certain criteria. In a different state, it's defined by different criteria. Even within a state, different schools of therapy and insurance carriers have different standards to establish what level of activity goes over the threshold of normal into pathology. However, Revolba's primary point was that higher and lower levels of natural activity are not moral or immoral. A child who's more active is not bad. They just are. And that makes hyperactivity a truna, not a mita. It's part of who the child is. It's part of his essence. You can try to rip it out but you're going to rip out part of the kid with it. And it can be channeled. It can be channeled and become very productive. You know, I'll tell you, there are certain careers you cannot succeed at without having a higher than average activity level. Like, you cannot succeed at being an NCSY director unless you're a little hyperactive. That is the fact. And there's a lot of careers like that. There's people who can't make their contribution without their inborn level of activity. Okay, now, the obvious problem that we encounter in the real world is that we, and this is, this is an accusation and I believe that it's true, we don't know how to adjust our educational environment to the child's activity level. A classroom that is based on children sitting quietly at their desks will work for some kids, but not for many others. There are classrooms, I've seen them, whose structure works only for children with lower than average activity levels. And for an average child to avoid disturbing there, the teacher will insist the child be medicated. There are many classrooms, and you know this is true, there are many classrooms today, even in Jewish schools, where most of the children receive stimulant medication to calm their external activity level. Okay, that's not a sign of genetic drift in that particular classroom. It's a sign that the educational environment isn't flexible enough to accommodate most of those students' tunos. And there's a cost. There's tragic human cost. Some of who those children could eventually have, have become, some of what they could have offered society, is going to be crushed. It's going to be ripped out of them during their so-called educational experience. Individually, that child will not be as big as he or she could have been had the educational system channeled their activity. And, and as a group, our society will not end up being all it could be because we will have destroyed some of these students' potential. Our society will be less rich because of the damage that we did by trying to tear this tuna out of really normal kids. When I say normal, I mean there's nothing wrong with them. They're not bad. Regarding inborn amoral traits like hyperactivity, perhaps autism, certainly colorblindness, the Torah offers a powerful lesson. The Torah's principle is onus rahmana patre. 
God only expects of us what we can deliver, not a drop more. God never, ever asks us to do more than we're capable of doing. Now, while not 100% of these sorts of traits are necessarily tunos, and a person may be able to change and grow a little bit within this, within this particular trait, a little bit of the hyperactivity is not inherent, a little bit of the autism may not be inherent, still, when a person hits their limit, we accept that. And then we refocus on channeling the person's strengths, not trying to force them to be someone they're not. Okay, so the first Tor concept that we have to understand to answer your question is the idea that there are, there are tunos and there are midos. The, the, the moral and immoral traits, those are changeable, but the immoral traits, they're not changeable. Okay, the second Tor concept that is it's really crucial to resolving your question is the concept of mazel. A person's mazel is basically a combination of, to put it loosely, their genes and their environment. Mazel is the totality of the gifts, both internal and external, that God gives us. The Talmud entertains a robust discussion of whether Jews actually have a set mazel, or whether for Jews, their mazel is adjustable. The Talmud's conclusion is, Ein mazel li Yisrael. That means, if a Jew's divine mission requires rising above biological or environmental limits, that is possible. Okay, and you're shocked, biological limits? Yes, the classic example of this is, I'm going to say something personal. My great, great, great grandmother. I'll give you an illustration of rising above biological limits. My great, great grandmother, who's actually mentioned by the sages of the Talmud. She was Abraham's wife. My great, great grandmother's name was Sarah. And my great, great grandmother was born with a physical disability. According to our tradition, she had no womb. She could not conceive. There was no organ for that. It was physically impossible for my great, 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 great grandmother, Sarah, to give birth to a child. The problem for Sarah was conception, the creation of the Jewish nation, was part of her divine mission. She didn't have, she was never given what she needed to fulfill her mission. God needed Sarah and my great, great grandfather, Avram, to conceive. So Abraham and Sarah prayed from the depths of their heart. They simultaneously, they did everything in their power to naturally conceive a child. And God made a miracle. That's how I'm here. That's how the rest of the Jewish nation exists today. Because of a miracle brought about by prayer and vigorous natural efforts. We cannot underestimate how involved in our lives God is and what sort of miracles he can make when that's required. Many of you experience such miracles. Miracles are normal in a Jew's life. Ein mazel Israel. We don't assume miracles will always happen, but we nonetheless pray for them while still, do, still doing everything we can possibly do to manage the situation naturally. And we know that sometimes miracles do happen. Okay, now getting back to your question, you very insightfully concluded, quote, I see these labels as signposts. If I've been diagnosed with autism, I have extra vote in the area of empathy, just as the next person has extra vote in the area of anger or jealousy. If I'm diagnosed with OCD, I need to work on my bitachlan to a greater degree than the next person, and so on, end quote. You are 100% correct. We must first do all the work we can to see what percentage of a person's limitations are tunos and aren't going to change? And what percentage of those limitations can be ameliorated with highly professional therapy and hard work? Okay. Once we've done everything we can to minimize the limitation, and we know that what's left, what we're staring at now is a tuna, then we need to flood the scenario with creativity and figure out how do we channel this trait in the best possible way? And finally, we need to ask whether perhaps this trait is actually interfering with this person's Avodos Hashem. 
And if so, then we need to pray from the depths of our heart that Hashem make a miracle and give Sarah a womb. Fantastic question. Really, really good. Again, please jump in with follow-up if you have follow-up on any of these questions. I hope you liked that answer from Rabbi Kellerman. If you'd like to listen to more questions and answers and ask your own questions, as well as listen to brand new material that Rabbi Kellerman is producing right now, check it out at lawrencekellerman.com. You put in your name and email address and we'll send you free lectures from all the new material Rabbi Kellerman has been publishing. Let us know if you have any questions. Info at lawrencekellerman.com.